What's up guys? Meathead Mason here with another video, and that's Spur over my right shoulder, keeping his eye out for the cancer culture mob, hoping to protect me and my future. The reason I say that is the next book I want to uh, review for you is Woke Racism, How a New Religion Has Betrayed Black America by John McWhorter. Since this book is a very sensitive subject, I do want to start off with a personal caveat. So I do believe racism exists, obviously, right? Uh, it is definitely real, and it will probably always be real, at least in my lifetime. I don't really see any way to end racism because there's probably always going to be one dude who's, you know, just a bigot. Uh, that's just how it probably will always be. Um, but at the same time, I don't think racism is nearly as big of a deal that the media and the modern world makes it out to be. And the reason for that is a couple of fold. One, there's a huge profit incentive right now to blame racism for everything. Uh, it's also very popular to do so. Uh, and I think one of the other things is it's a flaw in psychology where many times when you ask somebody, like, why'd you do that? They expect one answer as though there's one reason why you take any action. Like, why'd you reject that applicant? Well, it's probably a multitude of reasons and one of it could be there's a better applicant. Uh, but the, like, why did I get out of the military? It was a lot of reasons that factored into that, not just one. But when something involves racism, they just say racism. And that's it. And there's no other communication. There's no, no other explanation. And so it becomes easy. At the same time, it puts the blame on the perpetrator and the person claiming to be the victim is now blameless and has nothing to change about themselves because it is something that is not their fault. And I think that's what makes it just like such a good comfort blanket and is why uh, it's an additional problem right now. And then the final thing is, once again, not all racism is real. Um, so yes, once again, I did say racism is real, but not all racism is real. For instance, uh, I believe the Jesse Smollett case has proven that, you know, he was guilty. He fabricated that racist incident against himself to try and make him seem more sympathetic. Um, I am a United States Air Force Academy graduate, and you know, I always have that in the background, Army, Navy, play per second. But just a couple of years ago, there was a racist incident at the prep school, not actually the actual academy, but the prep school for people trying to get into the academy, where like a noose and some other hate crime instances were left on the door of a cadet trying to go to the Air Force Academy. And when they investigated it, they found out that similar to Jesse Smollett, the guy was being thrown out because he wasn't good enough to be at the Air Force Academy. And he perpetrated a hate crime himself to make him seem more sympathetic and blame his failures on the hate crime as opposed to, you know, or the stress leading up to the hate crime as opposed to his own failures. And, you know, it made national news for several weeks that the Air Force Academy was racist, even though it wasn't even at the academy, it was at the prep school. Um, and the general made a big speech that was famous. But, you know, when it was proven that it was actually the individual claiming to be the victim was the perpetrator, just like Jesse Smollett, you know, the media didn't retract that. So I just think racism today is a much bigger problem in the public narrative than it actually is in reality. So let's go ahead and dive into the book and hopefully I'm not canceled yet. So I first heard about John McWhorter specifically because I love Bill Maher. I'm always watching Bill Maher's monologues on YouTube and just anything that gets highlighted on YouTube for me, I usually check it out if it's from Bill Maher's, uh, you know, Late Night with Bill Maher, Politically Incorrect with Bill Maher, uh, just because I find his insights to be really both good as far as his political observations as well as, you know, his humor. And John McWhorter is a constant guest on his show and I've really respected some of the things that John McWhorter has said over the years that I've seen on those YouTube clips. So when John McWhorter was publishing his book, I picked it up up right away. It sat on my shelf for the last about a year and I finally gotten around to reading it. Um, so definitely enjoyed it. It's really insightful and it's really great to hear a contrary perspective on a topic from someone who's in the industry, I guess. And one of the things he points out is like many times throughout this book, he talks about how only a black person could write this book, one, but then he also talks about the, how it's humorous that people then say that he's not black enough because he's writing the book. So it's just, there's a lot of irony in this book and I really enjoyed it. It definitely is good to read both sides of any uh, argument. And, you know, if you're alive today, you pretty much get the, the left side anytime you turn on the news. So it was kind of good to hear an argument in the other side. And I definitely agreed with most of what John McWhorter said in this book. As I work to get canceled, let's go ahead and start off with my criticism of this book. And yes, that does mean a white guy is going to be criticizing a black author. So, oh my God. Um, now, this book is countering the leftist arguments of racism and wokeness, right? And those are largely emotional arguments and arguments based on logic and do not usually have too much statistical, mathematical backing to them. It's just, you know, this person feels this way and you need to accept it. That's okay. You know, lived experiences are important. Um, however, 
I thought uh, John McWhorter, he countered those emotional and logical arguments with similar emotional and logical arguments. And I would have loved to have seen some hard statistics, but he didn't really provide those too often, which is okay. You know, the book was still good. I still recommend it. And I enjoyed reading it because once again, it gave me both sides of the narrative that's going on today. Um, however, let me give you an example of what I would have liked to have seen. So in one part, he's talking about black law school students, specifically those, he says, get into a school that they wouldn't have gotten into without affirmative action. Um, and so affirmative action allows minorities to attend schools with an advantage that their, I guess, white counterparts wouldn't have gotten. Um, so what he talks about is specifically that black law school students actually fail the bar more often than their white students. And that's because he, what he says is kind of that they've been accepted in schools that they wouldn't have gotten into. And as a result, they're not given the prep work that a lower tiered school would give, right? So if you go to a lower school, tiered law school, they their intro courses may be better than say Harvard Law. Like Harvard Law probably assumes that you're you know already pretty tip top. And if you need that intro course, you're not going to get that at Harvard. And so that's why what he says is why the affirmative action is actually setting up some of these black law school students to fail. Uh, however, he didn't ever give any numbers. Like I would have loved to have seen the numbers of white Harvard law students and black Harvard law students or versus, you know, uh, a community college at, uh, in a local area, something like that. But he did not provide that. And I thought that was the biggest weakness of the book. But once again, highly recommend it. Definitely enjoyed it. And I'm glad I read it. The book starts off with citing some of the victims of cancel culture. And I have to say, it's very scary, right? In this modern world, it seems as though if you say one statement that can be taken out of context and is offensive to someone and goes viral, which you know you can pay to make something go viral, especially if it is seen as offensive, um, you can get canceled and lose your entire future, everything you've ever worked for. So, it, and it's really interesting to like what meets those criteria. I just mentioned some of it is fake previously, right? And Justice Small approved that. So, but it's crazy how criticizing a black person has become a racist example, right? Even if it's warranted. Um, as far as I understand, only God is infallible. Um, so all of us have a reason to be criticized from time to time. And at the same time, the converse of that, standing up for a black person seems to be considered a virtue, regardless of if it is needed, desired, wanted, or even correct. It's very strange. Uh, but once again, that is that virtue signaling. Right off the bat was one of my favorite parts of the book, and that is on page eight and nine, he has this kind of cool chart where you can see 10 items of the, where he lists the double-edged nature of the current narrative. And so specifically, I wanna read a couple of these. So on page nine, item number seven in this chart, on the left side, when whites move away from black neighborhoods, it's white flight. On the right side though, when whites move into black neighborhoods, it's gentrification, even when they pay black residents generously for their houses. Seems like some of the stuff I've heard, right? Uh, so damn if you do, damned if you don't. I also like this one on eight. If you're white and only date white people, you're a racist. But if you're white and date a black person, you are, if, if only deep down, exotifying an other, right? So once again, it's still, no matter what you do, you're going to be criticized and canceled. And so once again, he has 10 examples of those. Buy the book, check it out. Page eight and nine, it's a great section. The main thesis of the book is that the woke narrative has become a religion, right? I mean, the title is Woke Racism, How a New Religion Has Betrayed Black America. And what he does a great job of is comparing the differences between the zealotry of religious extremists to the zealotry of the woke. And he does an incredibly good job. I remember when I first started reading it, I was like, this is a reach. And then at the end of the book, I was like, all right, you got me. You, can, you did a good job. You conveyed your message and you won your argument. Uh, so John McWhorter, great job. Uh, highly recommend the book. Um, and I'll say once again, I just point out when I first started, I was like soft, weak, but as he made his argument, I was like, wow, it's really good. And the best comparison is right. Like if you think about a radical Christian or a radical Muslim that knows that their God is the right God and they're going to convert everyone in the world um, and that no, no, nothing they do can be wrong because they're doing it for righteous reasons. That's how the, the left looks at it, right? Like they want to destroy society because it is for the good of humankind and for their woke God. Uh, and what's interesting is he points out on page 40 that nothing will ever be enough. And once again, that's because there's a profit incentive for people to create the woke narrative, as well as there's really no end point because racism is probably always going to, there's always going to be that one racist probably. So let me read you this quote on page 40, quote, to these people, actual progress on race is not something to celebrate, but to talk around. 
This is because with progress, the elect lose their sense of purpose. Note, what they are after is not money or power, but sheer purpose in the basic sense of feeling that like you matter and that your life has a meaningful agenda. Take the idea that even if Trump didn't win a second term, he did win a first one. It wasn't that long ago. He did not lose by a landslide. And the racism in America suggested by all of this is what we really need to be talking about. No, this is not a hypothetical. Hot on the heels of President Biden's inauguration, Ta-Nehisi Coates published an article titled, Donald Trump is out. Are we ready to talk about how he got in? And so once again, it doesn't matter how far you go, there will always be something that still needs to be corrected. Even if it's not in the present, hey, it's in the past. We need to, we need to fix the past too. Um, so it's going to be something that is used to control you and manipulate you probably for the rest of your life. And I thought this did a great job of explaining it. And the final thing I, I, in that quote, I mentioned the elect. So what he calls repeatedly is those people who are of the woke religion, he calls them the elect because they are the elect on high telling you how to be morally superior. There are definitely thousands of books out there on how to find meaning in life, right? Um, or how life is meaningless, let's say. And so it's really interesting to hear him say that, you know, the woke religion is the meaning for many of the people, right? And especially when you factor in that a lot of the people on the left uh, seem to be anti-Christian or anti-religion, then the woke wokeism becomes their religion, right? So it is a very good comparison. And what's interesting, he talks about, you know, not just the meaning of life, but a sense of belonging. And what I love when he talks about why being like a woke elect is attractive to individuals in the black community, what he specifically talks about is uh, joining and quote on page 80, quote, you want to adopt an identity as a beleaguered black person where you're, you are united with all black people, regardless of social class or educational level by the common experience of suffering discrimination, end quote. So once again, regardless of if you've seen discrimination, regardless of if a black person's ever been arrested, He's, it's an incentive to adopt the narrative that you are oppressed because once again, it gives you that identity, it gives you that sense of community, it gives you that sense of purpose. And it's also that warm blanket that I mentioned earlier where it's not your fault. The other thing I found really interesting on page 80 where it, it kind of explains the attractiveness of the woke narrative as well, where he talks about, he cites Karl Marx talking about, you need to, in order to create a movement, you need to create an obstacle that has to be overcome first. And this racism obstacle is the obstacle that it seems like the left is creating that they can unify everyone against as a battle, right? Like, um, I think what was the the Watchmen, the movie? It's like you need to have a common adversary, and that's what makes people unify. So the common adversary is racism, and you know, once again, I think it's going to be a never-ending fight, and it's a shame that we're wasting so many resources on something that is probably uh, mostly most likely hyperbole. He makes another great argument a couple pages later on page 90, where he talks about the education and the indoctrination of that oppressed feeling, right? Many uh, comedians and public figures talk about the oppression Olympics or the victim Olympics, where people want to be able to claim to be oppressed or victim victimized so that they can have that elite status or feel like they're morally superior than their oppressors. And so people then are looking for the oppression and they're educated to find it. Um, and it was interesting, uh, so let me also criticize myself here. I previously said that he doesn't use many good statistics. And here in this quote, I'm going to use one of the quotes that he had great statistics. And this one blew my mind. So on page 90, quote, for example, a Pew Research Center survey identified something readily apparent on the ground that college often teaches black students a view of whites as oppressors. 9% of, of black high school students reported experiencing racism regularly. The number doubles among black college students to 17.5%. I mean, that's incredible, right? So the number of people reporting to being impacted by racism doubles in college versus high school. And he doesn't give too much analysis on it. So this is why, I, so I'm gonna criticize this a little bit. So he kind of just cites that as, as I mentioned, as I read that quote, uh, college professors are telling their black students that they are oppressed and so then they're gonna be more likely to see it. And he's saying that that's why that, for that increase. And that's probably part of it. Once again, I talked earlier, there's usually more than one reason for things. I would guess that a part of this is also maybe a black college student is now surrounded by white people for the first time in his or her life, right? Maybe a black student went to a mostly black high school, got into a college that is now maybe 50% white, 50% black, or even more white. And so suddenly they're just surrounded by white people that they've never been surrounded by before, and they're definitely gonna feel it. So he didn't cite that at all, and I thought that was a flaw in this argument. The next quote he makes that I loved and blew my mind, um, 
was about, once again, that conformity of the black voice where specifically like the news chooses only to put a specific person uh, on camera because it it like helps their narrative. And I'll, I remember I grew up watching uh, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and I remember there was one episode where Will Smith gets really upset that this like the local news showed in a very uneducated black individual and he wanted to go on the news and show that like black people can have eloquent conversations. And I remember that that episode really uh, spoke to me and I, it really you know it stuck out to me. I still remember it what like 30 years later. So on this quote on page 116 quote Zora Neale Hurston in 1938 asked, quote, can the black poet sing a song to the morning? And noted that, no, the one subject for a Negro is the race and its suffering, and so the song of the morning must be choked back. I will write of a lynching instead. Nothing has changed since 1938, except that if you read that passage aloud, a squad of undergraduates might report you to the diversity coordinator because it includes the word Negro. And of course, today we must write not of lynching per se, but of what happened to George Floyd and the societal attitudes that led to it, end quote. So, I mean, I love that because he's just saying, like, if you write something that is not exactly what the woke narrative wants, you won't be published. But if you write what the woke narrative wants, you will be published, you will be broadcast out, and your voice will be magnified a hundred times over. And I really want to think back once again to uh, Will Smith again. So I remember I was talking with one of my black friends when I was in the military. Uh, you know, I was talking recently, like we're both veterans now, we were just discussing this. And I, was, I mentioned him, I was kind of like teasing him, and I was like, you know, I, why is it that all black actors wear dresses? Like, you know, I was just like Tyler Perry. I loved Martin Lawrence as a kid, but I was like, you know, he, Shanene, he was always like, I, I was like, is there something in black culture that is why black men on television are always cross-dressing? And what he pointed out to me is no. And he got a little mad. He, he made fun of me because we're friends. And he was like, no, man, like Hollywood forces these guys to put on dresses or else they won't put their show on TV. And Will Smith was the first black actor to stand up to Hollywood and refuse to do that. Um, and you really look at Will Smith, and I have his book on, on my shelf over there. I want to read his memoirs, but after he slapped Chris Rock, that's going to move down the list a little bit. But, you know, that's one of the things I always, you know, I would say of all the characters I ever saw in growing up, Will Smith was probably the character I related to the most. Um, <laughs> so it's just strange. Um, but it blew me away because I feel like it, it's completely the same thing, right? Once again, a black voice that says something about joy and happiness will not be published, but a black voice that says something about discrimination, slavery, and oppression will be. And it's, it's just another form of manipulation and control. The final quote I want to leave you with is kind of tied to one of the other books I recently read, Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. Specifically, there was one line in Brave New World that blew my mind, and it was that there is no such thing as... Uh, intrinsic culture there is only taught and learned culture right like when you're a baby you don't know shit and then over time you're formed through your uh, in your interactions right nature versus nurture kind of thing but culture I guess he's saying that there is no nature there's only nurture um, or, and that's in uh, Brave New World and so this quote on page 163 by John McWhorter I really like quote as often as not today what a person feels is based on what they have been taught to feel by a paradigm that teaches them to exaggerate and even fabricate feeling. In other words, much too often the person who tells you to accept and go from how they feel has been, and as it were, coached, end quote. So what he's saying is, you know, once again, just like if somebody has been, every single thing they've heard their entire life is look for oppression, find oppression. Well, they're going to look for oppression and they're going to find it. But if somebody's entire life has been taught that life is good and that there will be obstacles that you have to overcome and there are bad people in the world and that's going to happen, you should just keep grinding and accept it as, you know, you're kind of better off not working with those guys in the long run. You know, it's different. At the same time, there's a very big difference between today and the 60s, right? Like in the 60s, we needed all of this, definitely. Um, but in 2022, I don't think that the racism is nearly as big of an issue as it was, you know, in 100 years ago. And so I think we're dealing with some of the leftovers and some of the pain that's, you know, that is real and genuine. Well, let me wrap this up with uh, just one final anecdote. Now, I'm a huge reader. I've always been a reader, especially when I was a child. I grew up reading a lot of science fiction. And I'm going to put a picture, probably here or here, of uh, some of my favorite books as a child that are on my bookshelf right there. And what's interesting, you know, we can look at the names of the authors, but I don't know the race of a single one of those authors. Not one. 
and that's the difference between the world 30 years ago, at least for me, and the modern world, right? Like, pretty much it seems like you have to know the race of something right off the bat now. But I never used to care. And I, I mean, I still really don't. Obviously, I mean, I'm reading a book by black authors. So it's just really interesting to me because I, I feel like I know the race of the last 20 authors that I've read. But when I think about those books over there, I don't know the race of a single one of them. And so that's just a difference in the nurture of my lifetime where race has become the central focal point. And with that being said, this book really uh, opened my eyes in a lot of ways because as I said, when I first started reading it, I thought it was a silly argument of comparing uh, the woke left to a religion. But that's because you know I, I am a little bit religious and I believe in the value of religion. Um, but as he made his argument, he definitely opened my eyes, changed my perspective. And now I can kind of see the zealotry of the left a in a little bit more of a clear way, as well as, you know, uh, realizing that it may be something that's here to stay and who knows if it'll be dangerous or not, but it's definitely going to be an impact on society for years to come. Well, that is it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Please don't cancel me um, and have a great rest of your day.